Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, I think when we look back on the last five days, one of the things we're going to define here is how active it was in terms of the production of squall lines. We call them mesoscale convective systems in atmospheric sciences, and you're watching here an animation that goes up till early in the morning on uh, Monday morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, showing you the latest of these pushing through parts of the southern United States toward the lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, this is is an infrared satellite image so the colors here tell you how cold those cloud tops are but check out this radar animation of the same system and what you see here are these long arcing lines of thunderstorms and I'm going to talk about those because we are now fully into kind of a summer convective mode here and we're going to see a lot of storms like this progressing across the United States for probably the foreseeable future here so when we just put it all together though we've had just going back to the 18th okay we've had 2,272 reports of severe weather and each dot each circle you see here is a separate report of either winds over 58 miles an hour a hail bigger than an inch or a tornado but of all these dots 1893 of them were from severe winds and that's what happens when you get these big long arcing lines of storms and one of the most active days was friday you can see over here look at all the blue dots those represent wind speeds over 58 miles an hour we had storms watch the animation start over again right here ready starting in colorado moving through nebraska through northern kansas getting into iowa missouri now cutting into illinois indiana kentucky tennessee going all the way to georgia south carolina north carolina do you see that that's one big arcing line of thunderstorms that went from Colorado to North Carolina. And that's what these thunderstorms are capable of doing. And it's amazing to watch them do it. Now, I pulled these out of my notes from a course I used to teach at the University of Illinois to show you a cross-sectional view of these squall lines. You often know that when they approach you, you see this beautiful shelf cloud, this low-hanging cloud that uh, kind of gives you a warning. Hey, the nasty part of the storm is behind you. So the shelf cloud sits right out here. But the main convective part of the storm, the part that produces the really heavy rainfall and gives you those strong winds in the squalling which damage so much of our crops are followed right behind the shelf cloud and this is what one of these storms look like i've said this many times in these videos we want to watch out for when these storm systems bow forward like this because when they do that the back to front flow called that rear inflow jet you can see it right here is powerful and it will destroy a lot of things in its path and we've seen a lot of these they feed off of gulf moisture and we have had no problems keeping the gulf of Mo uh, gulf of mexico wide open i guess we should call it the gulf of moisture what do you have here well this was just going back to last friday night we had 70 degree dew points that extended all the way up into parts of southeastern uh, south dakota and it was this big upper level low that was bringing that moisture up so if the moisture's there these storms basically produce their own fronts on which to lift new parcels of air, new cells to make big massive thunderstorms. And it happens right here at the leading edge of the storm. So they basically just dive down into this hot, humid air and go racing forward. They form best on uh, wind shear environments where there's not a lot of change in direction, but a lot of change in speed. So we put that all together. Just look at the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. While some folks got a desperately needed break, I'm talking about parts of Michigan. Now, this is just over the last couple of days and parts of Ohio. We saw a lot of squall line activity across much of the rest of the midsection of the country with some places there in, Ken in Kansas and Missouri and Arkansas and Oklahoma picking up an additional six to eight inches of rain out of these. And the rain that's been coming through here has, has impacted the wheat harvest and is also certainly impacted you know the early growth stages of our corn and soybeans in those same states okay are we going to be seeing more of this well this is the current picture of the flow of the atmosphere right now we got to watch a couple of things first off will be this trough here very weak flow across much of the united states until you get over here into the eastern corn belt where we have this really sharp trough and this large ridge that's building here well this trough is going to be providing the upper level support today uh, which will combine with quite a bit of moisture in the low levels of the atmosphere both from the water that's already in the soil and in the plants that's evaporating and the gulf of mexico to produce a pretty stormy day in parts of the eastern corn belt getting up to the northeast but after this we have a pattern change that's important for us to discuss 
Storm Prediction Center in the day on Monday. So that's the map that's over here in the upper left-hand corner. Got a wide corridor here where we have the threat for strong to severe thunderstorms. And you'll see in a few minutes, we also have to watch the dry line coming out of Texas uh, for more storms as well. Getting into the day on Tuesday, that's the map that's in the upper right-hand corner. We're going to be watching again for a, a pocket here in parts of uh, Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois. But this stretches back down into parts of the Central Plains uh, as well. Finally, once we get into the the day on uh, on Wednesday, which is the bottom map here, got a bit of a pattern change. We're going to be seeing a pretty sizable ridge moving into the middle part of the country, and that's going to change things up quite a bit. It's also going to dramatically reduce our predictability on when and where these thunderstorms are going to form. But let's at least go with what we know right now, and that is from our high resolution rapid refresh model. The upper level low is sitting and spinning right here, and it is going off to the northeast, and it has a front that is dragged all the way down here to the Gulf Coast. And so we're going to see uh, not only this storm system progressing toward the southeast but a lot of thunderstorms building in this area and then coming in on the back side of this too you're going to see some more showers and storms so let's watch this all play just through your next 36 hours getting you out uh, into the uh, middle of tomorrow so this will be middle of, of tuesday watching it again you see the storms progressing through the southeast. You can also see storms late tonight. Watch in Texas. They blow up right there in the evening hours in parts of central and western Texas. Meanwhile, parts of Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, getting into the northeast, you're going to deal with the main frontal kind of lobe of this storm pushing on off through that area. So a lot of warm, moist air out ahead of this being lifted to produce the rainfall that you see here. Uh, and on the back side, just watch it again here with me. You can see from Montana through the Dakotas, Minnesota, we still have widely scattered scattered showers and thunderstorms in that area. So this is the exiting upper level low that has been a major source of precipitation for the last five or six days as it slowly moved from parts of Montana, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, over now toward Ontario and Quebec. That's where this thing is going. Okay. Now we got to make sure that we fully understand these maps before you, you, you sit and, and pick out and pluck out values. All right. We have the over on the left, I have the European model on, I'm not on, I'm sorry, the European operational run just going out to next Monday morning. And on the right, I have the GFS just going out to next Monday morning. So this is a basically a seven day forecast. When you look at this, yes, you see less giant blobs of red, which is what I think I've been showing you since February. So I'll say this, the pattern is drier than we have been seeing, but it is not dry. Okay. Remember too, we're going into a more summer like convective pattern, which means we're not going to be able to pick up on the day to day uh, position of thunderstorms as they go racing across the country. Uh, so the model trend is drier, but there's high variance right now in each model run. So when we take a look at this and you find your location, just to remember uh, our ability to forecast the type of thunderstorms that will be happening at least over the next seven to 10 days is going to our confidence in our forecast will be very, very low. Now, let me tell you why I'm going to animate for you the flow of the jet stream here, taking you all the way out to about the eight or ninth of July. And when you watch this pattern evolve here, I want you to notice a couple of very important things. Let me pull you back right in through here. Okay. First of all, getting through Monday night, into Tuesday morning. First trough, the one that was over the Great Lakes states, must exit and go northeast. As that happens, that other trough I pointed out, the one that was sitting here off of the west coast, the northwest coast, it digs down such that by Wednesday morning into Thursday morning, a sizable ridge begins to build in the midsection of the country. Now we're looking at the European ensemble here. So what I want to tell you is that while this ridge is building in the middle part of the country, there will be a, a, an upper level um, cutoff low that will kind of sit over parts of uh, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana and spin right in through here. And you'll see it again in a few minutes is what it's going to do for temperatures and precip. But the dominant pattern to finish our month, and we've been talking about this for a while, will be this west coast trough with a ridge building over the midsection of the country. And this is going to allow for some heat to rebound, getting all the way up into southern Canada. And we need this. We need something to help us catch up on our deficit and growing degree days. Well, that ridge sticks around. Look at this. I'm out to the 30th. Now I'm out to July 1st. And really, when you look across the United States, it's going to be this west coast trough and this uh, far, kind of northeastern trough that sits here that really help dominate the flow across the midsection of the country. But as we progress into the beginning of July, so this is July 3rd, getting July 4th, 
fifth, and six. I want you to see a couple of things that happens. Now, I know you're looking at the colors here, but don't look at them specifically. I want you to look at the flow. We do see that overall the jet stream is doing something like this. Do you see that? Now, that's important because there's going to be some sort of ridging that's happening in the midsection of the country, maybe having more of a trajectory like this, with a fast jet stream coming off of the Pacific. Now, this is very characteristic of what's going on right of the quasi-biennial oscillation, also with the recent change we've seen in the behavior of the open tropical Pacific in terms of pressure patterns, we're talking about the Southern Oscillation Index, that also has something to do with El Nino, all of which I'm going to cover in detail in Wednesday's Long Range Outlook. But the bigger picture is, look at the flow of the height lines. There is actually a broader trough sitting here across the eastern half of North America. And why I'm telling you that is when we get into this particular pattern, we will have northwest flow. And with that northwest flow across the Corn Belt, it'll be one that is not warm. In other words, we're not going to be getting hot and staying hot, but we will continue to see a lot of convective activity, a lot of thunderstorms, maybe similar to what we've seen recently. A break in it in the near term, but if we go back to this pattern in July, we're going to get that. Now, as we start off our kind of higher resolution view here from the European model, let me just get you right here to, to Tuesday uh, evening. Now, at this point, you're going to see a lot of higher atmospheric pressure in this area. And you're just going to see flashes of green. And why you're seeing that is this is the way the European model picks up on the daily convective activity that will be happening under this ridge. Because this ridge sets up, as I, st I just went from Wednesday to Friday night here, notice that you didn't see any large low pressure system moving across the country. That's what I mean when I say this is a summer-like pattern, okay? So I got you out now. I just went through the weekend. This is getting into Monday morning. And you just keep seeing these flashes of green pop up like this. Why you're seeing this is because this is the model showing the convection happening, the thunderstorm hap the thunderstorms happening. Higher atmospheric pressure on the whole, but no lack of moisture. There's plenty coming from the Gulf, and there's plenty already in the soil in the lower atmosphere. So our predictability is way low right now in terms of precipitation. But overall, that's what you see. Now, you're going to see a lot of maps like this one showing up. This is uh, the European Ensemble going out uh, basically the next 15 days on the left. And I have the GEFS. That's the GFS Ensemble on the right. And overall, what do they agree on? Well, they kind of see this as a wetter location. See that? Kind of in there. They both have this kind of drier corridor in through that area and then wet down here and then dry in the southeast. So there are some similarities between our two major global models here. But I'm going to tell you, if you're sitting in this region and through here, I will say, yes, it is drier than you've been seeing, but almost anything can be drier than what you've been seeing. What I really want you to hone in on here is the fact that that area will have a lot of thunderstorm activity, despite the fact that the ensemble models pick it up as dry. OK, there's plenty of moisture to work with and northwest flow that builds in once July gets here. <laughs> you're still going to see this happening. OK. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Now, let's talk temperatures. What As we move into this pattern, where we have this bigger ridge that sits here, yeah, the northwest United States, cool. California, cool. <clears throat> right in through here. What we got going on in the next five days? Well, first of all, it's raining a lot there in the next couple of days. Uh, and then what we're going to be seeing here is this upper level low that sits in here in day 6 through 10. And where's that upper low, level low going to be? Well, as we get this bigger ridge that builds in like this, we can often get these little cutoff lows that sit underneath it. Now, a couple of degrees cooler than average in Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas at the beginning of July isn't really too much to write home about, but it just shows us that it's not going to be the extreme heat that we can sometimes get this time of year. Meanwhile, the north central plains, the north central part of the United States and the Great Lakes states, east to the west of them there, getting some much, much needed warmth. But what about the day 11 through 15? Remember, at this point, we end up getting a flow pattern that does something a bit more like this. And at that point, what we see here is warmth returning out west and overall much closer to average temperatures across the midsection of the country. And we don't want average right now. And this is the reason why. This map, I got a great request from people that watched the videos. And if you want to see something, you just have to ask. So I got asked, can you start to show a map that shows the total accumulated growing degree day units since June 1st? 
Now I made the map with a terrain background, so that's what it looks like this, okay? Uh, so when you look at the colors, it's, it's a terrain map, but it's really showing you how many groin degree day units we've accumulated. And what we've seen right now is, well, let's look right in through here because that color is about 500. No, we're trying to get for our corn crop somewhere around 25 to 2700. And this is what things look like through the 22nd of June. Now, sometimes it's easier to see this in terms of anomalies. So we can see that because of how wet and cool the eastern and uh, uh, kind of the, the northern part of the, uh, uh, the eastern northern part of the Corn Belt has been. I'm talking Michigan, okay? Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. We are still in deficit in terms of growing degree day units since the start of June. We are slightly, just ever so slightly above average here. Uh, kind of in the western corn belt in the northern corn belt where it's been extremely wet and cloudy we're in deficit here but the extreme heat earlier in the month on the west coast has got them way ahead same thing with the southeast so we're going to look at these maps every day we're just going to keep watching them because as you remember from my last thursday's update we're concerned that if summer stays cool this crop may mature very very late and put us at risk of a frost that's what we're talking about here okay all right to finish this up i'm going to give you some longer range analysis i'll be talking about this again on wednesday but this is all the way up to the end of the month. We can see that the models are favoring a flow pattern that's doing this, and that is not one that brings in warmth through the end of July. So our concern is how this crop is going to mature. All right. I'm going to take you to Europe very quickly as we finish up this video. We are expecting some pretty extreme heat in some very important places across Europe this week. Now, these are just the high temperatures on Wednesday. I just picked a day midweek to show you, but we're talking about temperatures getting here uh, close to triple digit in terms of degrees Fahrenheit. There will be some active severe weather, especially today on Monday coming through this area and also all around the Black Sea. We're watching for scattered showers and thunderstorms today. But look at what happens, the map that's over here on the right, by uh, the day five through 10 time period. We got a bit of a change. We're gonna end up seeing the flow pattern of the atmosphere doing this. So this trough that's sitting here is going to send several low pressure systems through parts of uh, this northwestern part of Russia. Now remember, Black Sea sitting in through here, which means the heat that they're getting right now around the Black Sea is not forecast to last, but of a cooler time period coming up days 5 through 10. And just to make sure that this is clear, with those troughs coming through here, producing wetter than average conditions, just notice, let me just color this in for you, here's the Black Sea on this image. Over here, it's pretty easy to see. So a lot of this rainfall is going to be happening in the northern part of the Russian wheat belt, while much of the states that surround or the countries that surround the Black Sea do hang on to their slight dry ice, but it's not nearly as dry as it was. Meanwhile, for the most part, much of Europe through the heat wave it's about to sustain is going to be on the drier side. And finally, I'm just going to finish this up with two last maps here. First, this one is showing you, at least getting you through uh, Thursday night and Friday morning, total accumulated precipitation across uh, parts of India and China. China's main growing area actually is very dry through this week. No major heat stress, but dry. Indian monsoon is still trying to get going here, extremely hot on the northern side of the, so they're not shaking that pattern. But down here in south, uh, south, southern China, we are at least uh, not nearly as wet as we have been over the last month and a half or so. Some drying down here as the Mayu front moves. And the last map is this one. While there is no tropical activity going on right now in the Atlantic that we're worried about, we do have a system that is sitting here just south of Mexico uh, that is going to be important to watch, could be developing here. Here, and the steering winds might take it off in this direction. It's just that time of year we have to watch the tropics very carefully. Okay, a lot to talk about there, but let's go ahead and wrap it up right at that point. We at Nutrient Act Solutions hope we look forward to all of our forecasts coming out this week. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.